Revelation chapter 2. I feel that that's the most appropriate place to start on a New Year's Eve night is go to the book of Revelation. For some of you that don't know, that book, Revelation, is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Read verse 1 of chapter 1 and you'll see. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not the revelation of doom and gloom and the end of the world. Read what your Bible says. Chapter 1, verse 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. How do you know we need in 2017, we need a revelation of who he is. And how awesome he is. How powerful he is. We need that revelation tonight. Can you hear that? And we're going to go in the Word for a few minutes tonight, and then as the Lord will lead, I usually take the time to speak prophetically to what God has said to me uh, during a period of time of waiting on Him, that we would announce some things prophetically that what God wants to do in 2018. We have been on a journey these many years in that process, and we have heard God clearly. We've heard God here at this church. We've heard God uh, clearly about the nations and about the things that are coming. And it was uh, not long ago that we stood right here on this pulpit and declared somewhere nine months before it happened of what 9-11 was going to look like. We declared prophetically. There's a book with it in there. And, uh, and, and it was a prophetic declaration. We stood right here and declared that there was an earthquake quake coming and, and it would come within 30 days and would shake a nation to its very foundation. It was not within, it was about 30 days uh, that Haiti was just shook violently with that earthquake that devastated it. And God is good and he's true to his word. He still has prophets today. Can you hear me? The Bible says if you believe the prophets, you'll prosper. Amen. And so I urge you today to come with faith with me as I take us on a journey for a few minutes, not long, and we're going to step through this little portal of, of glory and step into 2018, and we're going to believe that God will do what he says he will do. Amen. You have faith for that tonight? Amen. How are you coming along with me? Amen. You're going to come with me tonight. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And I want to read just a little bit to you. And then the angel, messenger of the assembling church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has, who has and welds the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you live, a place where Satan sits enthroned. Well, that's pretty heavy. Yet they, you are clinging to and holding fast my name. And you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed and martyred in your midst, where Satan dwells. He says it again. This place was a place where Satan dwells. Now you have to understand the region. I'm not going to take the time tonight. But they had a, a, a library with over... 200 volumes of books in this place. It was a citadel, citadel of learning and, and, and knowledge and insight. This was, a, this was a, a very high level place. and You had all kinds of philosophy and philosophers. Nevertheless, verse 14, I have a few things against you. You know, these seven churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus reveals to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos there, and he's telling him what these churches represent, the church of Ephesus and different ones, that Thessalonica and different ones. He's talking about those cities and those regions and how the church's role played out in those places. And he said, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Uh, you have some people there who are clinging to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, to set a trap and a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to entice them, to eat food that had been sacrificed to idols and to practice lewdness, giving themselves up to sex, sexual vice. You also have some who are similar, who in a similar way 
are clinging to the teachings of Nicolosians, those corruptors of people, which things I hate. These were some of those scholars and some of those uh, 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 teachers that were teaching another doctrine other than the doctrine of Christ. And he said, verse 16, repent. Repent then, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. How many know God uh, said, if, if, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and I'm going to fight against you with the sword of my mouth. What that means is, is God says something, his, his, his words are sharper than a two-edged sword. Can you hear that? Now, watch this. Watch this story. This is a story of, uh, of, of the revelation of Jesus now. But Pegamus is the third church of the seven churches. Pegamus means uh, from the Greek language, mixed marriage or much marriage. I'll say it again. That word Pegamus means mixed marriage. Now, <clears throat> in this prophetic statement here and, and what uh, John is having revealed to him, by the Holy Spirit, by the understanding of the spiritual things that he was perceiving here, he began to understand this piece. And I'm going to open it up a little bit here for us so we can see it because it has to do with the prophetic word that God has dropped in my heart. And again, pegamus means the Greek mixed marriage. Boy, is it true today that the church, this is about the church now, this is not talking about uh, uh, the, the heathen is talking to the church. How many of you here tonight? Yes. How many of you here tonight? Yes. Let me hear from you. Yes. You're the church. Yes. So that's the word for you. Yes. And it says mixed marriage. That what that means is that we've, we've brought some things into our lives uh, and we've got a, a mixed marriage in the sense that we're married to two at one time. And he was talking about being married to Adam, the first Adam, and then married to the second Adam at the same time, Christ. And how many of you know that, that God says that's not going to work? You can't be married. Even in Scripture later, uh, the gospel says uh, that you can't love, you can't have two masters. For you will either hate one and love the other or vice versa. Come on. And, and, and so John is having this thing open up, and, and the word mixed marriage is very important for 2017 because the church is full of mixture. We got a little bit of the power of God, and we got a little bit of just some soulish stuff. We got a little bit of Jesus, and we got a little bit of just some soul, some carnal things. Come on. And now you understand that in that world, you can't live in either. You can't live in those two worlds at the same time. Come on. I mean, no, you can't be in this day of, of, of serving God and try to live in two different worlds. Do you hear me tonight? And that double-mindedness is what the scripture says. When you are double-minded, you've got two choices constantly. You're unstable in all of your ways. Have you hear that? People who are double-minded, they can't make up their mind who they're going to serve. Jesus talked about it again in the Gospels. He said, you're going to either serve mammon or you're going to serve me. Mammon is money and some other things. And so it helps us to understand <clears throat> that this church is one of mixture and duality. 2018 needs to be a year that we put away double-minded mixture. We put away of being committed to something other than Christ and become who we're supposed to be in Christ. Come on. Because too many in the church today have one foot in and one foot out. We're kind of in God. We're kind of out of God. And we kind of drift back and forth and we have two lovers. Now when it says here that they, they had a dual love affair going on with the first Adam or the second Adam, which is Christ. Another way to look at it is they were in love with the law and then they were in love with grace. 
Because the, the law had been introduced by the Old Testament and it had come through Moses and now Jesus came and he introduced grace. And here were these people with a dilemma. They, 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 they were stuck in between the two. How were they going to choose? They were going to choose the law of God or were they going to choose the, the grace of God? Come on. They're struggling, changing the way they think about who it is they are married to. See, this whole thing is about them being married to one of them. They were either married to Adam or they're married to Jesus. Come on. But in typical Christ form, he says something in verse 16. I just read it. He said, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance, it says in one translation, was as the sun shineth in his strength. What that means is, out of his countenance came revelation. How I mean, you know revelation brings illumination? Moses goes up the hill, gets revelation, comes down and his face is glowing because he's got not only revelation, but he's got an illumination. See, revelation makes you understand the mystery of the, of the plan of God, the purpose of God. But when you have illuminate, that means that your inside, your, your soul, your very makeup has now been brightened by that revelation. And you really understand it because it's in you. Come on, have you hear that? See, it's down in you. The truth is what sets you free. And when you have truth in you, then you don't want to live half-baked. You don't want to live in two different worlds, in the world uh, uh, of sexual uh, uh, endeavors and then the world of trying to be righteous. You don't want to live between the two worlds. Uh, you don't want to be out drinking and then out uh, on Sunday coming in the house of God. Come on. You see, when I got saved, I came out of all that hell and I came out of it and Jesus came in my life, and I got married to Jesus. Amen. Let me help you, because theologians have been confused. A lot of theologians are so confused because they, they, they say that one day, now I titled the message tonight, it is the end or it's a new beginning. It is the end or it is a new beginning. You see, because all over the globe you're going to hear uh, uh, those uh, pronosticators and those that will speak about the end times and they're going to be talking like never before. We've been through it. I've been through it. I've been a Christian for 44 years and I've seen them get excited about the end time. I mean, you know, people today are really excited about the end time. Why? Because, oh my gosh, the trumpeter, Mr. Trump, he declared Israel to Israel that Jerusalem would be the capital. My God, any dummy can read the Bible. For 2,000 years, the capital's been Jerusalem. These guys didn't wake up in the morning and say, oh, we're going to make Jerusalem. God said it before any of them were ever thought of. <laughs> but oh boy. They're coming out of the woodwork. They're going to watch 2018. They're going to be writing books. They're going to be telling you, oh, just stay with me a minute. I'm going to show you some of the things that are being said. But we got to understand the question, is it the end or is it really a new beginning? Boy, is that going to make a difference. Now, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Boy, that's important. Hebrews 4.12 confirms the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword in piercing even to the divining asunder of soul and spirit, the two again, and of the joints and the marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Look at this. The word there says in, in Hebrews 4.12, it says it's quick, it's powerful, and it's sharper. How do you know that that, that there's a quick, powerful, sharp word that needs to come in 2018. And how do you know the word will come quick and suddenly God will say, and God's word is quick, it will do this, it will quicken your mortal body. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it'll quicken you. How many of you have ever had this word, quicken you? 
you read it and you read it 10 times and all of a sudden one morning you get up and you read it again the same book the same page the same verse and all of a sudden oh your spirit leaps and you say my god i understand it it's quick and have you know it is very powerful it can change your life forever Hebrews is a very powerful prophetic book written by the Apostle Paul. Chapter 4 also says that there was a people who failed to enter into the rest that God desires for his people. And that rest was about this law and grace period. Trying to figure out, am I under the law or am I under grace? And so there was a people that, that says in the book of uh, uh, Hebrews there that they failed to enter into a rest. See, when you realize that under grace, it is a finished work that Jesus did. It is not a work to be done. Uh, it is not a work that's coming. Uh, it is a work that's done. You see, when I got saved, uh, I got born again, uh, and, and I got married uh, to Jesus. And, and, and preachers have been preaching that one day, one day, I'm so tired of hearing about one day, and in one day, one day God's going to do, one day God's going to be. And then all of a sudden preachers start saying, well, you know, one day Jesus is going to come back and there's going to be a great marriage and the, lamb, and the supper of the Lamb and we're going to be married to the Lord. Shut up, don't tell me that. Because you just busted me. I've been having an affair for the last 44 years. Because I become passionate in love with him. He is intimate with me and me with him. And if I'm intimate with him, I've got to be married to him to be intimate. If I don't, I produce illegitimate sons and they're bastards. But if you understand the kingdom of God and you understand the word of God, you are not dealing with that law of the past uh, of having to go and offer sacrifice for sin over and over and over again every year, but you once and once for all entered into the grace of God. Uh, he died, bled, uh, and he rose from the dead for you, and because of it, you are done, you are finished, you are born again, you're a new creature. Amen. And if I'm married to him, I need to start acting like his wife. And not acting like he's just my friend. So I can come and go when I want. I don't have, see, see, being married, I've been married 47 years. I'm talking about commitment. Some of you people sitting here tonight, some of you young folks, you don't even know how to spell that word. You, 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 you commitment. I was doing a marriage up here one day, one day, and this young girl was getting married to this young man, and she had a hard time with a word. When I said, do your vows, he did his. It was time for her. She went to do hers, and she said, she was supposed to say, I submit, and she said, I, 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 <laughs> well, everybody in the room did what you just did. They started laughing. I said, take a deep breath, girl. You got to say it. She backed up and breathed real quick and whew, submit. I thought, Lord Jesus, they're still married. I thought, Lord Jesus, that's going to be a trial. Now, how many of you understand uh, there's a process of God uh, working some things in our life so that we aren't just having an affair. We are married to him. We're not waiting to get married. I'm not waiting for one day. That one day already came. See, everybody's worried about and wondering, when's Jesus coming? Well, he's coming again, but saints, I got to tell you the truth, he's already come. He came a bunch of times. He came to Mary. It's, the Bible says he appeared to Mary. He's appeared many times. Hello? But that don't qualify us to go, uh, qualify us to go write a new book. Jesus is coming. And then we start adding all these pieces together, and we start talking about it's the end time. Well, I got to tell you something. I've been through enough of them saying that, that I've outlived their end time. I either missed it or it ain't come yet. Amen. Hello. Some of you grew up in that kind of teaching. Amen. We're going to fly away. 
I ain't flying nowhere unless it's with American Airlines. I have a million miles on that, so. <laughs> Hello. I ain't looking for a cabin. I don't like cabins. I stay in nice hotels now. Yeah. I used to sleep on the street with cardboard boxes, but I don't want to go to a cabin in glory. Yeah. That would be so... If streets are, 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 are paved with, with gold and, and there's pearl gates uh, and emerald rainbows and I got to stay in a cabin, I'm going to be protesting. <laughs> Come with me. Because I'm going to take us through this now. And we're going to land somewhere. Are you ready? Yeah. Now, the rest is from the works-based relationship to a finished-based relationship with Christ. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God who is at sundry times and in divers manners spoken time past unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things and by whom also he made the worlds. Have you know he says a key word here. It says spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in, the, hath in these last days. What's that word hath mean? It means past tense. He already spoke. Can I, get, can I get your attention tonight? You see, we've been waiting for him to speak. We've been waiting for him to come. And we've missed when he's been here. We've been going around saying one day, one day Jesus is going to come back. Well, all right. I don't know if I'm going to be here. But I thank God 44 years ago in February, he came. He came to me, and I got saved. I got born again. How have you glad he came? How have you know he'll come again? But how have you know we cannot let the world uh, teach us these funny ideas of us standing at the window instead of putting our hand to the plow. We're standing at the window. He's coming. He's coming. Shut up. Put your hand on the plow and plow your field till he does come. Got to hear this, don't we? Amen. Now, Paul referred to these times as the last days. 1 John 2, 18, 19. Little children, little children, it is the last time. Matthew 24. Please put it on the board. Matthew 24, because that's a very important part of what I'm saying here tonight. Matthew 24. Please look at it. And, and, and it's, it's so amazing here. Jesus departed from the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings of the temple and point them out to him. And he answered them, Do you see all these? Truly I tell you that they will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And while he was seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will this take place? And what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the completion, the consummation of the age? And Jesus answers them, what does he say? His first words, be careful that no one misleads you. Oh, come on, saints. First off, he ain't telling them anything. He starts off by saying, don't let anybody mislead you. You deceiving you are deceiving you, leading you into error. That's verse 4. For many will come in, my, uh, in on the strength of my name, appropriating the name which belongs to me, saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. Verse 6 is what I wanted you to see tonight. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened or troubled, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. You say it out loud with me. The end is is not yet. You know, people say, oh my God, we're going to war with the little guy in North Korea and the pajama guy. You know, we're, we're going to go to war with him. Let me tell you something, saints. There's one church in South Korea that's got 800,000 people. I've been there. I've been in those meetings. I can tell you for a fact. They got 800,000 born-again, spirit-filled believers in that church. 
That's not only that church. They got a prayer mountain that's got 25,000 people that pray every single day. They got these things called grottas. They're holes in the cave where you go in and stay for 30, 40 days at a time and fast and pray. And you can walk up there and hear the mountain rumbling with people's voices being magnified up to the Lord as they pray through the days and the nights as they fast. And you mean to tell me that 800,000 people are praying and haven't bowed their knee to Baal. And that little guy in the pajama is going to be able to do something that's going to disrupt what God's plan is. Oh, I'm here to tell you, we have listened to fools for too long. Because I want to tell you something. The earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. He said, well, don't you worry about him You're going to bomb somebody? And let me tell you what's going to happen. There'll be something that happens, but it won't be that it's man done. It'll be something that God does. Change is coming in that regime. Trust me when I tell you. I told this church over a year ago when there was panic everywhere about he's going to take us to war. We're going to war. I said, stop it. God hadn't told me we're going to war and we won't go to war till I hear from God. He said, well, that's an arrogant statement. No, he said he will not do that which he's not performed or spoke to his prophets before he does it. Now, you can say amen or oh me. I'm telling you the truth today. Watch this. I'm going to prophesy to you in a minute. I want you to hear the word of the Lord for 2018. But I got to give you this basis of an understanding. Before we explain further the whole dual marriage mentality Dealing with the old, the, the old, the Adam, the old nature, the Old Testament, the whole process, the law, and embracing the new life in Christ, we need to address the current hysteria that's not new, but it's old, and it's called the end time last days. How many of you hear me? And, and it's increasing. It's increasing, and it's going to increase. You're going to hear it more than you've ever heard it before. We are addicted to and have been from the beginning of time to the end. Now, how dumb is that? We are so after the end. Why would you want to know the end? Because if it's the end, you're dead. Man, I don't want to know that. I came to live. Listen, I was dodging bullets and getting out of jail, and finally I got a chance to live, and now I want to die. I don't want to know what the end is. I want to know what my world uh, purpose is. Can you hear me tonight? Say, well, you don't believe that Jesus is coming back. Yes, I do. I do believe that. I just don't believe that we're supposed to pack our bags and sit on the curb and wait till he comes. Because there are a lot of people that need to come to Jesus and need to say, how do I get saved? Uh, and I'm not packing my bags waiting for his glory. I'm going to go ahead and walk in his glory. I'm going to walk in his anointed. Because I am the bride. Uh, I'm already married. Uh, I have intimate relationship with the king of kings. Uh, and I bring him to the party. When I show up, he comes because I bring him. My wife don't ever go to a party that I ain't there. She brings me with her. You think about that. Matthew 24, 6 now told us that, but the end is not yet. Be careful that no one misleads you, it said in verse 4, deceives you, leading you into error. And by the way, all of these events Jesus was referring to were happening at his time in the earth. They were happening right then. When he was talking about the end, he was talking about right then. And there's a whole other world there. On December the 6th, 2017, President Trump, the trumpeter, the Trump master, the trumpeter, however you want to trumpet him, announces that America will move its embassy to Jerusalem and in doing so recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. I said it a minute ago, a bunch of dummies, read your Bible. It's right in there. How do you know the scholars are getting re-educated all the time? Watch this unfold here. Watch this. Stay with me now for a minute. 
If more of these people would read the scriptures, they'd understand that better than 2,000 years ago, it's been declared that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. Oh, you've got to read Zechariah chapter 12, and it'll tell you right there, saints. It'll tell you that Jerusalem was always meant to be, Zion was meant to be what it is to Israel. Can you hear that? There are five events unfolding right now from this declaration that Donald Trump, President Donald Trump made. Here's five things that are starting to escalate already. You can look it up. You can check it out. But I'm telling you prophetically, it's already opening the door of this. Watch what I tell you. These five events, Jerusalem acknowledges as being acknowledged as the capital of Israel now. And nations are starting to put, move their embassies there. It'll take us two to three years to build our embassy because it's so large. But here's the thing that's going to flip everybody out. I'll give you the other ones. The Bible says that there's going to be a, the temple's going to be rebuilt. Well, here's what's going to happen. They're going to build it in the wrong place. They're going to build it on the dome of the rock. But that's not where it is. It is in the city of David. Solomon's temple was in the city of David, which is 1,200 feet from Jerusalem. It is right outside. It is 1,200 feet. And that's where the temple will be found. And they're going to go and build it on top of the dome of the rock. And look, it, the, the Arabs and everybody are going to freak out. And we're going to go to World War III. And they're all going to war over the thing being put in the wrong place. But Mark, what I tell you, prophetic understanding through scholars, through uh, those, that are, uh, uh, those that study the uh, ruins of things, uh, uh, and uh, it's just starting to come out. Revelation is bringing illumination, and the head uh, guy that's the archaeologist for Jerusalem has now discovered that all these years they've been looking at it in the wrong place. Oh, it's going to shift, saints. And have you know, they'll build the temple, and it won't have to be World War III. That's going to mess up a bunch of theologians. They'll have to get a new book. People will continue to return to Israel. It's going to happen, and it is happening. Nations will rage against Jerusalem. Nations like the United Nations with 138 people, 138 countries attacked Israel, attacked America for supporting Israel and Jerusalem as being the capital. That's going on right now. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 and 3 tells you. Nations will rage against Jerusalem. And then it's number four is Armageddon. Armageddon is a valley, and that's where this big war is supposed to happen. And then number five, they're going to build the temple again. Let me tell you something quickly about the temple. They will build the temple. I mean, they've already started work. They've already got things going to make the temple happen. And preachers are going to preach about it till, it, till it, they're, they're tired. But let me tell you something, saints. God's church of the redeemed who's married to Christ and not married to the first Adam are not going to celebrate in a temple that we have to offer goats and bulls and lambs because Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We are not going to Jerusalem to slay animals and go through that Old Testament process again because Jesus paid it all once and for all. It's done. And people will get all lit up and get all into this thing. We're going, they're going to build a temple. My, that's the end time. No, it ain't. It ain't the end time. And I guarantee if God lets me live long enough, you come see me, I'll be here. And it won't be the end of time. Because that's not what God was trying to show us. How I many you know instead of seeing, just imagine with me for a minute. Imagine it's not the end, but the beginning. Imagine it's not the end of time, but the beginning of something brand new. Where God raises up his chosen to live on the earth. Oh, what a marvelous thought. How you know, saints, too many people have been wanting to fly away. But I'm going to tell you what. See, I used to get mad when I first got saved because, I, you know, we were told to put on the armor of God. And then somebody started teaching we were all going to fly away. I got ticked off. Because you put me in armor, I'm thinking I'm going in for a good fight. 
I got dressed up to go fight. I loved to fight. I used to love to box. I didn't like getting hit, but I liked to box. And I had the armor of God, had my feet thing, had my shield, I had my sword, had my belt on. I'm ready. We're going to fly away. I told everybody, I told my pastor, I ain't going. Y'all go, I'm going to stay here. Have you know God didn't make me a conqueror to fly away? What am I going to conquer in heaven? Ain't nothing to conquer in heaven. I got to conquer something down here. Whoa. Still there? Do you know, this is amazing now, 1917, the bell for agreement, the Lord was restored, the Lord restored to Israel uh, the land. The Lord restored to Israel the land known as Israel, but not Jerusalem as the capital. That was in 1917. Fifty years later, 50 years is Jubilee, and 50 years later is the celebration of the Jubilee. One of the victors' celebration is the land returned in 1967, restoration of Jerusalem in the Six-Day War. I have a Jew sitting in here, and he's shaking his head looking at me. He knows what I'm telling you. Now, after the Six-Day War that happened, listen to this, 50 years later makes it 2000, makes it December the 6th, 2017. 50 years later, Jubilee, we went from 67 to 17, and in that, it's 50 years, 50 years, the year of Jubilee, 49 is really the 49 years of Jubilee, but it's the 50th year that you celebrate it. Amen. Is God doing something? Oh, yeah, God's doing something. Can you hear me today? And, and next week, I mean, the next event to watch is May the 14th, 2018. May the 14th, 2018, Israel will celebrate her 70th, 70th anniversary as a reformed nation. Israel was resurrected as a nation May the 14th, 1948. 1948, one year before I was born. Now some believe that this is the Daniel 9, 24, 27. So seven years from 2018 is 2000. And 25. And so they're going to start talking about that we're getting ready to go into the period of tribulation after May the 14th. Watch what I tell you. May the 14th is going to unleash the most confused mess. They're on TV already. They're doing videos. They're doing YouTube. And they're all talking about it. Coming up May 14th and in seven years. We're going to be in the middle of the tribulation. That gives me tribulation. You say, well, you're making fun. No, I'm not making fun. But I can tell you this. By vain traditions, we bring to null effect the commandments of God. And people are so hard-headed, they won't face the truth. And they'll hold on to something from the past. I'm not going to Jerusalem I've been there many times. I preach there. I'm not going there to sacrifice some animals in some new temple. I bring my sacrifice every morning before my God. And I offer to him the, my sacrifice of the fruit of my lips. Wow. Here you go. Now we're going down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. We're getting there. We're going to land here. I'm going to give you something to think about. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in China, what's going to happen in Turkey, what's going to happen in, in some other countries. And uh, there's some countries that God's going to use and that God's going to stir some things up. Are you listening to me? I'm going to talk to you about artificial intelligence and what it does and what it's going to play. The AI is going to have a role to play. But you've got to listen to me for a minute. Are you still with me? Some of you sit there and you get comfortable you start sleeping. Just pinch yourself or stand up, shout, act like you're spiritual. Everybody else will say, oh, that person's on fire for God. No, you just woke up. <laughs> Lord, help me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But as the suitable times and the, pres in the, prices, the precise season and dates, brethren, you have, no, you have no necessity for anything being written to you. But you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the return of the Lord will come as unexpectedly and suddenly as a thief in the night. 
When people are saying all is well and secure, there is peace and safety, we have to watch because President Trump just said that. He said, I'm going to bring peace and safety to Jerusalem. And in that moment, unforeseen destruction, ruin, and death will come upon them as suddenly as labor pains come upon a woman with a child. And they shall no, by no means escape, for there will be no escape. But you are not given up to the power of darkness, brethren, for the, that day to overtake you by surprise like a thief. For you are all the sons of light and the sons of the day. We do not belong either to the night or to the darkness. Accordingly then, uh, let us not sleep uh, as the rest do, but let us uh, keep wide awake, alert, watchful, cautious, and on guard, and let us be sober, calm, collected, and circumspect. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But here it is, but we belong to the day. Have you know it's a new day? Have you know God birthed us into a day? Because if you understand creation, Genesis started the first night and the day. It was not day to night, it was night to day. How do you know when you got saved, you came out of darkness and came into light? Read Genesis, you'll see. The first day was night and it became day. Aren't you glad we're coming out of darkness and we're walking in new light? We're going to live in the day, saints. We're not going to live in the night. But we belong to the day, therefore let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us, listen, to incur his wrath. He did not select us to condemn us, but that we might obtain his salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who died for us so that whether we are still alive or are dead at Christ appearing, we might live together with him and share his life. Therefore, encourage and admonish, exhort one another, and edify, strengthen, and build up one another, just are as you are doing right now. How do you know, saints? Verse 9 says right there, we have not been appointed to wrath. Come on. I've been appointed to grace and his kindness and his mercy and his love. Can you hear that? And because the law convicted me of sin, now because of it, I have been forgiven. And because I've been forgiven, I no longer have to live under the condemnation of the consciousness of sin because I'm free from sin. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. All have sinned and fallen short of the gap. But my new life changed all that. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Nothing is falling apart. It's falling into place. Tell somebody, ain't nothing falling apart. It's falling in place. He already ordered it. He divinely set it up. <laughs> and, and, and if you hear this, you go back to the book of Revelation chapter 2, the church of Pegamus is a mixed marriage, mixed church, church of mixture duality. She is stuck somewhere between law and grace. We need to get out of that and get saved and get a hold of the truth of God setting us free. And we've been free for life. We're not under condemnation. Can you hear that? We don't need to be double-minded anymore. We need to know he said that we have a white stone. The white stone was out of the Urim and Thummim. It was a white stone and a black stone. The white stone is what he gave us. And the white stone says you've been forgiven. The black stone says you've been guilty. How do you hear that? Jesus isn't going to sanctify the bride he already has. We're not going to, he's not going to marry us. We already are. Can you hear that? Now, we've been liberated from one of those days mentality. Can you hear that? Can you say with me, thank you, Lord. I'm no longer waiting for one of those days. One of those days is not coming. It already came. Now, it said that Satan's seat was there. Oh. It said right in Revelation chapter 2, I said it to you. I know the works and where they dwell us, even where Satan's seat is. Look at this. In Colossians 2.15, the power of Satan's seat is revealed. And here's what I want to tell you. Religion is a major seat of Satan. The Lord showed me that England and the faith that England has had will dry up and be replaced with both the radical and the non-radical Muslim faith. England will no longer be known as a Christian nation. England has turned a corner 
and will become a nation that turned its back on God. India has been eating stale bread of revelation of times past. I spoke to a pastor from India this morning and I prophesied this very word to him. Your father, I prophesied to him that you got to go home and stop feeding the people of India stale bread. Stale bread is old revelation. You got this bread right here that's on this pulpit. Uh, this bread right here is made today. It's fresh bread. How do you know God wants to give us fresh manna, fresh bread? Not some old dead revelation, some old dead practice that don't work anymore. Amen. That dead bread, that revelation of the past, and, it's, it, and that its faith has been so mixed with so many religions in India, it will be the center for demonic occultish worship, and the witness of Christ will all but dry up. India's in trouble unless its preachers repent and begin to repent and begin to preach the now message of the kingdom and stop preaching old things they learned back 30 years ago. Have you know one of the problems in the church today is we've been serving people old food. This is not last day rations that we serve people. This is fresh manna that drops down by the Holy Ghost out of the heavens tonight that God will give us a fresh word for right where we stand. Can you hear that? We don't need any more stale bread. Until and if the new day church arises with fresh revelation, like Revelation 2.16, the countenance was a sun shineth in the strength. Persecution is going to arise in China. Again, as the government replaces God as its source. China is going to experience such growth and such demand that government will become better than God. Because you take a communist people and you turn them around and you give them everything they ever dreamed of and it comes from the source of the government, they will say the government is our God and not any invisible God. That's what happened in communism in Russia. That's what's happened in communism in every nation. When they get a little bit of Western or, or a little bit of democracy, they begin to see prosperity and they begin to think, wow, how did we get this? And they look and the government says, we gave it to you. Wow. The Olympics will become increasingly more corrupt and will be exposed for it. Sexual issues will rise, and these issues will steal the games. The games will become no longer a game of excitement. Kids will no longer be sent there and want to go there because of the corruption of these games. The pedophiles and the predators that hide within the doctor's ranks and hide within the coach's ranks will take advantage of young men and young women and ruin generations because of the pollution of their soul. There will be disruptions in the games from within and from without. And again, sexual issues will be exposed. Predators are planning to devour our young people. Watch the television. You'll see when the Olympics start, you'll see issue after issue. How many of you know you see right now all the time you turn on the TV and somebody else is being exposed? Yes. Some kind of sexual things being exposed. Isn't that right? Yes. Well, watch what happens with the Olympics. They're going to be the same thing. Money, money issues will continue to rise. Europe will pu uh, purpose doing away with cash. They already are. And the Bitcoin is not going to win. The Bitcoin's not going to make it. The banks won't let the Bitcoin succeed. They'll replace it with their own system. The economy is going to grow in America. It's going to be a great year of prosperity, but it is going to be a year of every kind of shaking you've ever dreamed of. But it will be almost an oxymoron because it will be a time where blessing and prosperity is just flowing at the same time. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Put your eyes on California. But there will be a thing that happens in California. And it will be a, a, a very powerful, very powerful act of God. Men will call it an act of God. And it will stun people what's going to happen. Write it down. Oh, I want you to hear this. Watch Turkey. You know, I was talking about banks. 
The banks told some of my elders the other day they don't want to work with nonprofits. They've been told across the board. Banks around the United States have been taught, told, don't work with the nonprofits. That's alarming because they want the church to not be able to survive. And if God's people don't hear that and begin to be generous and begin to support what they believe is the house of God, then the house of God will cease to exist. Wow. I want you to hear this. Put your eyes on Turkey. For Turkey, watch Turkey arise as a major player. Turkey's going to join with Russia, Iran, Syria. Iran's not going to be a big player long, but it'll be a player, and it's going to come against Israel. The new president that's in there right now, the president of Turkey, his opening declaration of his new being set in in his inauguration, he said, we will come after Israel. Whew. Iran may implode before it can be a problem. The president of Turkey wants to rejoin the land of the power of 1512 and 1520 called the Ottoman Empire. Ezekiel 38 and 39, read it yourself, tells us the alliance against Israel will come with Turkey. Against Israel. How many of you know we've been looking at Russia, but Russia's not going to be the big player? <clears throat> Turkey alone in just less than a year has established from 13 embassies, they now have 30-some embassies. Because what they've done is they've gone to Africa and they've gone to the countries that are poor and that are overloaded with radical Islam and they're going there to become connected to them. Wow. You still here tonight? Are you breathing? Yes. See, I write these things down as they come, and then I have to come back and compile them. Look at this. Oh, I'm landing. Artificial intelligence, AI, will, uh, and, and, and is, it will become the new religion. The ex, one of the ex-executives of Google has started a church in Silicon Valley, and they worship artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is dangerous. Hello. Because saints in time, they will be smarter than us. We will not tell them. They will tell us. Google is already, can you imagine Google and all these places? They take their children and they send them to schools where they don't allow the electronics that they sell us to work. Because they realize the danger of what's happening there. The inundation of information and of garbage that's being downloaded into a generation. And we haven't lived long enough through this electronic world. We haven't lived long enough through all of these machines to really have a measure of what is the consequences of it. Like we have with cigarettes. We now know they cause trouble. But trust me. Artificial intelligence is going to be a major issue. You ever heard of microchipping? Microchipping is going to be a fad like tattooing. People are going to flock to places and get it done. <sighs> Global catastrophes. I told you about California. 2018, major events coming. The sun's going to blow another hot solar flare called a CMA, E, a CME. A liquid ball of sun fire is going to be released. 2012, a ball of fire got released, and we didn't know about it. And it got one week within our solar system. And if it had gotten in our solar system, it would have hit the earth. The damage it would have done would have taken the whole crust of the part of the earth that it hit completely off. And 150 degree temperatures would have radiated out of the earth. Are you hearing me? You think it's not real, then why did they just send up a satellite this year to monitor and have a 12-hour to 24-hour alarm system to tell us when the sun flare leaves the sun? They call that satellite stereo because that satellite will pick up that ball of fire that will come and could get in our atmosphere. 
How do you know that's why we need to pray? These are things, things that could happen. How do you know that if God would tell us these things, he's telling us so we know how to pray? How do you know if we start praying like we should, we'll be able to push back the tide of wickedness. We'll be able to push back these things that are onslaughts against us and against the nations. Can you hear that? But if we continue to be prayerless, there's no defense. Wow. There must be a level of prayer, a rise in the level of prayers like the swarming locusts that we prophesied about this morning to cover America and devour the enemy's plans before they are allowed to be hatched. We must know the weapons the enemy will use by discerning the his seat, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every tongue shall rise against you in judgment. You shall utterly condemn for your righteousness uh, is from me, saith the Lord. Remember Colossians 2, 14 talks about uh, Jesus taking the, 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 the crucifixion of, of Satan. The, I mean, the crucifixion after that words, he took the, the, the paper that said that Satan had been defeated and he nailed it on the tree. And he said, Satan is defeated. How do you know, saints? He is defeated. The only weapon he has that's the strongest weapon is the accusation of accusing. Because he's the accuser of the brethren. That's why he keeps churches apart. That's why he keeps families apart. That's why he keeps saints apart. Because he's the accuser. He can't really do anything because he's been defeated. You hear me tonight. I go back to Matthew chapter 24. And, and I'm going to close. Matthew 24. And if you go back to Matthew 24 and verse 6, what did I tell you? It said there in Matthew, it says, <clears throat> the end is not yet. I prophesy to you with my eyes open tonight that we are not going into the end. It's not this time for us to live always thinking one day. How do you know? I want to know that he's available right now. How do you know he can fill your life with his spirit right now? He can heal you right here. Do you know he can save you and change your life right here, right now? For the God that we serve is not a God that one day he will do. How cruel would that be? I have three children and six grandchildren. I just sent them a robot picture of me. And every time I talk, the robot talks. It's on my phone. So I sent it to all my kids and said, Happy New Year. And they were sending back laughing stuff to me. Because <clears throat> I sent him these little square robot, and he says, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And I was having fun with it and sending it to him. But I want to tell you something, saints. We live in the most amazing day there's ever been. This is not the end. It is the beginning. It's a new day. It's a day for you and I to walk in the covenants of God and to believe that you're not going to get married. You are married. You are the bride of Christ. You've already been redeemed. You've already been set apart. You've been washed by the blood. You've been saved. Now all that's left for us to do is live this way. We have to stop trying to live this way and begin to live this way. And believe what God says. If he says, I am blessed, then I'm going to go around acting like I'm blessed. If he says, I am righteous, then I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I'm not going to try. I am. Stand to your feet. Put your hands like you're trying to reach into heaven. Put them up there just like you're trying to move the clouds. Because right now, in, in just about a half a minute or a minute, it says it already is. We are in 2018. Harabakaraboshe. <laughs> hear me out. Hear me out. The things that I said to you prophetically, those things that will come to pass, here's what we must understand. They have nothing to do with it just being because it's the end of time. How do you know they have to do with God and things that God is doing and the earth is moving and shifting? It has to do with all those things. And we don't need to every time there's an earthquake write a new book. Lord Jesus, turn them bright flashing lights off 
They make me so I can't see. How do you understand that, saints, we don't need, we don't need to, 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 to have another earthquake to say, okay, it's the end of time. I'm so sick of them saying it's the end of time. Because you know why? A whole group of people will check out. Do you know why we have such pitiful politics today? Because in the 50s, everybody was preaching about the rapture and we're going to fly away. And nobody was going to go to college. Nobody was going to be around. The pulpits were confused and they caused a generation to give up and not stand in the gap and make up the hedge. How you know we need a generation that says, I've got time to live and I'm going to live my life for Christ. And I'm going to live my life with all my heart and be used by God because I'm not going to see the end yet. You know how dumb would it be to wait to the end of time and then you die of cancer the week next week. Why are you going to wait for that? Why are you going to wait for the end of time? How do you say, Lord, it's a new day? It's a new day. Oh, it's a new day. Come on. It's a new day. Oh, it's a new day. It's a new day. All things are passed away. It's a new day. Father, I thank you tonight. We stand this morning in the in the just the vastness of uh, the future of all that you want to do. And God, you're awakening the church. Uh, you're arming the church. Uh, this is your bride, uh, the most glorious bride. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that we're not going to one day get all the spots and wrinkles ironed out. But God, because of the work of Calvary, we are the bride. We are that precious bride. And we're not going to live in the one day I'm going to be. One day I'm going to change. One day I'm going to be. We're going to accept the fact today I'm a new creature. In Christ Jesus, old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. Father, we thank you for 2018. Miracles are going to be released. And Lord, there'll be wars. Yes, there'll be wars. There'll even be rumors of wars. And yes, there'll be conflicts in nations. Norway is a very dangerous place tonight. Norway is a very dangerous place. We have soldiers there for the first time since World War II. World War II, the first time America has soldiers in Norway. Why? Because right on the other side uh, of Belarus, Russia has put 12,000 soldiers there. So there's all kinds of activity going on. We just armed the Ukraine with the most powerful weapons you can buy. Why? Because there are going to be some conflicts going on. But have you know, ain't going to move me. I'm not going to live in fear. I'm going to win another soul. I'm going to live my life happy in Jesus. I'm not going to buy all them books and then put them somewhere in a dumb room Go get Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. That book is still wrong. All those years, it's been in libraries, and it ain't got right yet. Say, thank you, Jesus. It's the truth that sets me free. Father, I pray right now for your people all over this room. The illumination of your word to our minds. May it, God, uh, bring revelation, but may it bring illumination. So, Father, I pray all over this room, heads are bowed, no one looking around. This is 2018, and I want to be the very, very privileged person to be able to say to you that today, this morning, bright and early as it is, today is the best day of your life. Uh, You can give your life to Jesus. You can say yes to Him. Uh, He's the author and the finisher of your faith, uh, and you can say, Jesus, come in my life and save me because I want to live for you. I don't want to die. I want to live, and I want to live for you in 2018. 
And while heads are bowed and we're praying in this room, if you're here, would you just hold your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. Yes, I see your hand. Put it up there. Hold it up. Put it up. Say yes, 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 it's me. I want Jesus in my life, uh, and I want to live my life uh, as it is a new day. I see the hand back there. I see hands, uh, and I want you to hear me today. God uh, is going to bring you into his purposes in 2018. If you raised your hand other than to worship, come and stand with us right now. If you wanted Jesus to come in your life, come stand with us right now. If that's you, come quickly, quickly, quickly. If you're here, just get out of your seat, come. I don't want to labor it. I saw hands going up, but maybe you were just worshiping. That's okay. That's okay. I'm not going to labor it. You want to come down and get saved? Get saved right now. Right now, today. Today. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Thank you, altar workers. I thank you in Jesus' name. I thank you for those that are here tonight, that you'll bless them, and that the truth will really, really capture their hearts. We cannot live in the one day it's going to be when we have the privilege to live and this is a new day. It's a new day to live for Jesus and to be happy. How many of you are going to see something good happen for 2018? How many of you believe in just good things are coming your way? Come on, can we sing that? It's a new day. Do you know that? Do you know that song? You don't know that song. Okay, let's sing something to the Lord. Come on, put your hands up. We'll sing and we'll let you go. Come on, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Come on. Oh, mighty one. Oh, yeah. Bless the Lord. You heavenly host. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, yeah. Listen now. If you want prayer tonight before we leave, you need prayer for healing or anything, deliverance, breakthrough, whatever, just come stand right here. The elders will come and pray with you. I don't want to miss that. If you really need a touch from God in your physical body or something, come and stand right here and we'll pray for you. God bless you. I'm so glad you came tonight. And I know that God is going to keep us in 2018. We're going to prosper. We're going to be the most blessed people on the face of the earth. We're going to be like the locusts. And we're going to cover the earth. Uh, and the sound they hear from our wings uh, will be the prayers of the righteous prayers of the saints of God. Uh, we're going to be like locusts cut out uh, all over the earth. Uh, we're going to cover the earth with our prayers. Come on. Bless the Lord. Oh, mighty one. Oh, yeah.